reach out to to exist with those challenges and still uh, ensure that the administration of justice is free and speedy. Uh, I think the most important thing that uh, uh, I'm about to this is uh, the way in which a defense lawyer lawyer should uh, conduct a trial in a court. Uh, let me just start with the, how a criminal case takes shape. Now, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are young people who already have some experience here. Uh, but just to, just to uh, give you a flash course here, criminal cases start with registration of an FIR under Section 154. And uh, they see conclusion under either 169, which says that no case made out by the police, and Section 170, read with 173, which when police or the any agency says that, yes, there is a case that needs to be tried, and these are the gentlemen who need to be tried, and let's find enough charge sheet is filed. So our journey today begins from this point onwards, once a charge sheet has been filed, and what happens thereafter, and what are the important steps, steps and what is the role of a defense lawyer in this? So once charge sheet is filed in a matter under 173, normally uh, accused are summoned if they are on bail, and if they are not on bail, then they are produced before the court. And the first important step which gets underway immediately is the copies of the charge sheets which have been filed with the court, those are to be supplied to the defense uh, in compliance of section 207 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. Now this exercise seems like a routine one. Uh, I wish it was. It used to be uh, a little while back when the criminal trial in this country had not uh, become strictly adversarial. But unfortunately, uh, in the last 10 years or so, I have seen that it has become very adversarial. Traditionally, it is not supposed to be. Wherein uh, both the agency as well as the prosecution, prosecuting lawyers try to only present half-truth. And they present their half-truths by filing a charge sheet which do not normally include that evidence, whether statements or document, which favors the accused. Now it's an important, important step because uh, the next step in a criminal case is whether an accused should be charged and made to face a trial or he should be discharged and allowed to go home. Now a court, when it applies its mind on the issue of framing of charge or discharge, according to me, must have all the relevant material and it matters not whether that favors the accused or it favors the defense, whoever it may favor. What's happened in the recent past is that when prosecution files a charge sheet, it files only those documents which they think will advance their case. And they justify doing this by saying that the section 173 uses the word relied upon. Now, when they do that, they lose sight of another important section of the code, which is section 169, which in the first place, justifies the filing of the charge sheet, uh, wherein the opinion of the agency says, yes, there is a case to be tried. And 169 also says that whatever you see, whatever you see during the course of investigation, you go and supply, you file it in the court, and then it's court's duty to ensure that it's also supplied to the defense. Unfortunately, that is not being done these days. So how does the defense counter that? That's the question. Uh, there are three essential steps here. Uh, when a defense lawyer enters the fray and starts going through the charge sheet, the first thing that every defense lawyer should do is go through every seizure memo very carefully. Seizure memos will have items, chronologically explained documents, uh, articles, whatever it may be, and see that all those documents and articles are also now annexures of the charge sheet which has been supplied to them. If it's not there, then you can ask for those unsupplied items in the seizure memos. So that's step number one. Step number two is take instructions from your client, the accused, or whoever he knows from whom anything may have been seized. That person should step forward, explain to you that yes, uh, so and so document or article was seized from me and uh, now it, it must be justified that uh, why is the agency sitting on it? It's not been supplied to the court. And the third important step is the defense should insist upon getting the court to direct the investigating officer 
to furnish an affidavit that every seizure memo that I prepared has now been sent to the court. Once you supply these three, once you comply with these three steps, the picture becomes clear, and then it is for the court to decide whether or not the unrelied upon stuff, whether documents or statements, must be given to you or not. But it's not a gray area of law. Uh, there is ample statements of law here, which empower courts to supply even unrelied upon documents or statements to the defense. Uh, for instance, you can read uh, that Siddharth Vashish versus uh, State and City of Delhi, you can read Shashi Kala. And there's a recent pronouncement by Justice Nariman, which goes even a step further and says that if the magistrate before whom a charge sheet has been filed realizes that some important aspects have been overlooked, a further investigation can be directed. So a combination of these three, these, this uh, case law shows that the courts play a very proactive role and defense is duty bound to remind the courts of the duty that the law says whatever you seize, whatever the agency seizes should be supplied to the defense and should not be sat upon, should not be withheld and should not be held back. Because once the trial gets underway, then only those documents will be considered relevant and then a half-hearted and half-baked picture will be painted before the court. So that's the first thing. So here, it's important that defense is proactive. Defense continues to do what it's supposed to do. And defense goes through all the seizure memos and articles very, very carefully to see that every shred of paper sees, sees the light of the day. So three steps, go through the seizure memos, which have been filed, see all the items that are there, they're supplied. Uh, whatever seizure memo uh, was made from your client or any of the other person, known to your client, get thought that on record. And third, most importantly, get the investigating officer to furnish an affidavit that these are all that I did during the investigation. These are all the seizure memos that I have seized and prepared and filed with the court. Once that is cut, done, I think there is some degree of transparency that, yes, beyond this, there is no other material which has to be uh, filed with the court. Once this exercise is done, uh, we move on to the next stage. Now, what is the next stage? That's a very critical stage here. It's whether charge should be framed against an accused or he should be. Now, uh, this is a stage where uh, the courts and the defense have a very restricted approach. Uh, there is a Latin word called prima facie. Uh, it, lawyers love using the Latin words because they make them sound intelligent. Uh, it means based on the first impression and accept it to be true unless proved otherwise. So that's why I'm saying this is the approach which courts adopt while considering whether a man should be charged or he should be discharged. So the restricted approach is you see the prosecution material, you read the statements, you read the documents, and if as a defense lawyer, you feel that there isn't much scope for you to argue a discharge, you should go and concede charge. It also supports the legal economy in a way. Otherwise, if you see that that entire set of material, whether statements or documents, believing if the court believes them to be true, even then, no offense is being made out. Uh, for that, of course, you need to analyze the ingredients of the section. Then you go and address charges on that. That is one way of approaching. The second is if the evidence against you, your client is completely inadmissible. In that case, you can go and address the issue of charges. For instance, if, the, if your client is uh, someone against whom the only evidence which has surfaced is his own confession or uh, confession of one of his co-accused. Say, this is the total evidence against him in a case. Now, this is a case which will ask for you to go and address the court and say, don't frame a charge against me, discharge me. If these, three, uh, if these are not satisfied, then you should go and concede. Like in a murder case, if there is a witness who says that, yes, I saw Mr. A shoot B, and his statement is before the police, there is very little left for you to go and address charges because prima facie, based on first impression, court will say that, yes, there is a witness that the police has. He will come to court on some day when we frame a charge and get underway for the trial, and he will point, point it out to you. you. You will be pointed out as the man who, who pulled the trigger and killed B. 
So there's nothing to argue on charges. Now, uh, a new genre of cases, this whole economic offenses where uh, offenses like cheating or abuse of office, uh, this is a new area of criminal litigation which has developed. Uh, here, there is a little more room for arguing on charges. Uh, I'm, I'm departing from the special crime, the IPC crime of like physical offenses where there is a witness who sees, who feels, there's a doctor's opinion, where, is, where there is very little room for arguing, arguing charges. Now, these are offenses which are more document based than oral evidence based. And sometimes there are documents which weigh both the sides. Like uh, if A comes to court and says that I've been cheated of money by B because he uh, made so and so claim before me. And B says, no, no, that's not the case. Look at the email I've sent it to him and I've made the entire picture clear. So this is a kind of case where you can tell the court that don't look just upon his oral evidence. I've got documentary proof to counter his. Now this is something which will be a good case for discharge. So yes, but uh, apart, uh, still, uh, sports still take a very, very restricted view as far as framing of charge is concerned. So that's what you need to keep in mind uh, before you open your case because most people end up opening up uh, a lot about their case uh, even when they stand no chance of uh, going ahead of, of earning a discharge. So that's as far as charge is concerned. Uh, now we move on to the next big area, assuming that your client has been charged on a, of an offense and now there is a trial underway. What do you do then? The next stage is leading off prosecution evidence. Prosecution evidence is the mainstay of the case where witnesses come uh, they pose about what they know about the case, <clears throat> place documents on record, prove the content of the documents. Now, is your role as a defense lawyer passive or active when the first part of prosecution evidence, which is examination in chief, is underway? Because the cross comes later once chief is over. According to me, the role of a defense lawyer is very, very proactive even when examination in chief is underway although he, he can't really conduct it, but he has to check a few things. First thing, when I go back to now, uh, section three and five to 55 of Evidence Act. First thing that a defense lawyer should ensure is that only that evidence which is relevant gets into court record in form of oral or documentary evidence. Uh, if there is evidence which does not fall into the realm of section 5 to 55 of the Indian Evidence Act, that evidence will be treated as irrelevant and that should not be entered, allowed to enter the court record. Because if you read section 5 and section 3 of the Indian Evidence Act, there is may be led in a trial of relevant facts and facts in issue. Now, fact and issue is defined in section three, and in a criminal trial, fact and issue will be criticized on the form of a charge. But relevant fact is something that you have to spell out by reading carefully sections five to fifty-five. Now, when I gave the example of admission or confession of an accused, uh, if you read section twenty-five of the Indian Evidence Act, it makes confession made by a an accused in custody before a police officer to be irrelevant. The first reaction of every defense lawyer is to say it's inadmissible. But according to me, before it is inadmissible, it is irrelevant. It should not be allowed to enter the judicial record. Uh, 32, like it's a dying declaration, it's an exception to hearsay. So if there is a dying declaration, it's relevant, it's allowed to enter, although it's an except, uh, it's anti hearsay in a way, because someone comes and says, the dead, uh, the person who died stated so and so facts. But yet, since the dead man can't be produced as a witness, an exception is carved in the form of section 32. And a dead man statement, provided the rigor of section 32 is met, is allowed to be placed on judicial record. Likewise, uh, seven, six is rest gesture. Uh, if you go to eight, motive preparation and conduct, uh, 11, introductory. So all these things one needs to take uh, stop off, read carefully and see that these are the only fact pieces of evidence which meet the rigor of 5 to 55 and these are the set pieces of evidence which should be allowed to enter the judicial record. So I talked about admissibility that something which is outrightly inadmissible 
that should be blocked by the defense in examination of chief something which is irrelevant like which is not fitting into the scheme of 5 to 55 that should be kept out of judicial record and third is hearsay hearsay is a man posing as the carrier of evidence of a man who he has seen or heard and what facts the second gentleman was aware of the third gentleman is coming saying yes i saw this man say this this man came and told me so and so now this is something which is expressly barred this is something which the defense should be on guard by taking an objection before the board that please don't allow any kind of hearsay evidence to see the light of the day or to be put on judicial record so once uh, these safeguards these three uh, important heads are taken care of the role of defense in examination in chief is important so stand there i mean don't start, don't object to everything uh, judges don't like it but yes uh, you should be well aware where to put your foot down uh, whenever uh, any kind of irrelevant or inadmissible or hearsay evidence is being sought to be placed on judicial record so that's something that you need to uh, be mindful another thing is uh, the best evidence rule uh, best evidence rule uh, under indian law uh, is crystallized in the form of section 60 primary evidence again uh, another way of uh, putting forth the hearsay thing, that any evidence which is given by the person who sees who hears who smells who senses who writes who authors only these people should be allowed to come to court and say that yes we are giving evidence of what we saw what we heard what we smelled what we sense what we authored or we did see something uh, happen with our own eyes and that's why we are competent so best evidence rule is something that the uh, defense lawyer should always be mindful of any departure from the best evidence any departure from primary will become discretionary because secondary evidence has limited scope in our system courts have to be expressly uh, requested by the prosecution uh, to give secondary evidence so this is how uh, the limited but proactive role of a defense lawyer is uh, is to be uh, conducted while examination in chief is, is underway now coming to the most important part once examination in chief is over and a witness is tendered for cross examination that's the most important that is the make or break for uh, any trial and uh, it's important for every defense lawyer to know whether and how and how much to cross examine how to ask what not to ask in what manner to ask now this is something uh, which requires a lot of preparation because criminal trial advocacy is all about marshaling facts facts which a defense lawyer is duty bound to present in such a way that it suits his client more than the prosecution he is there to create a doubt and the best defense lawyer is that which only uses prosecution witnesses and prosecution documents and uses those to his own advantage their cross examination plays a vital role now cross examination if we go to the origins i mean it's very interesting to go uh, to, to to see how cross examination saw the light of the day in our system now as you all know that we are uh, we are we are we have uh, adopted the common law uh, judicial system uh, if we go back uh, 150 years we'll see that even in english courts the role of defense lawyer began only in the 1870s before that it was only the victim the prosecutor the juror and the king the judge who had to administer justice and defense lawyers were not really uh, involved only after they made their entry uh, that this cross examination became a practice and of course a vital tool in the hands of defense to, to present their side of the story uh, but interestingly i mean that that's the disparity here it's the, it's the shocking part is although instances of uh, cross examination date back to uh, as 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 old as all the religions are so if you go back to uh, say bible you will see uh, there is a trial of a woman called susanna uh by two gentlemen who are elders uh business elders and then uh daniel daniel steps in and puts very pointed cross uh, questions in cross examination to the elders and then gets susanna acquitted uh if you go to uh 
Plato's the Apology, where Socrates, Socrates' trial is depicted. You will see how Socrates uh, defended himself by uh, cross-examining Anytus and Lycon, Meletus and Pericles, although he was sentenced to death. But these are instances of cross. Uh, if you go back to ancient Rome, uh, you can see Marcus Tullius Cicero having defended all his clients by successfully using the, the tool of cross-examination, uh, particularly in the defense of Sexton Lucius, who was accused of patricide. And even back home uh, in India, a 5th century play called Mirich Katikam, uh, which, which tells the story of a gentleman called Charuda, uh, shows instances of cross-examination where he was... Uh, accused of having murdered his mistress, but uh, with the aid of cross-examination, he was able to see that he's acquitted. So instances of cross-examination being there as a tool abounded, uh, but they were all lost for the longest time. But yes, after 1873, uh, both English courts, and of course, when James Stephens uh, adopted our Evidence Act, he spelled out in Section 138 that yes, cross-examination is a right of the defense. So interesting stuff. You should go back to this literature whenever you can. I think this is the perfect time for all of you to read, or read about all these. It, it gives you a perspective. Uh, it teaches you a lot. Now, why cross-examine? Uh, I mean, you get ready in the morning, uh, you go to court, there's a witness who's coming and you feel that, yes, I, mean, I, I need to ask uh, some questions to this witness and uh, that will impress my mind. Uh, if that's the approach, please don't do it because as Wendell Phillips, an American lawyer said that you can use a bayonet, I mean a, live, a knife which is attached at the end of a muzzle of a gun. You can use a bayonet for anything except to sit on it. So don't use this bayonet for sitting. I mean, don't do self-harm. Only do it for the restrictive purposes which I have in my experience learned. Now there's a, there's a twin test according to me that you must apply to a witness and to your proposed line of questioning before you decide that, yes, I am going to cross-examine witness Mr. A. First test is if your proposed line of questioning is capable of impeaching the credit of a witness. Can you impeach his credit? Can you weaken the force of his evidence? Or can you use this proposed line to destroy your opponent's case. That's test number one. Test number one has three groupings, impeaching the credit of the witness, weaken the force of his evidence, and destroying the case of your opponent. And test number two is whether your proposed line of questioning can establish your defense, what you want the court to see. Okay, so twin test. First has three groupings, impeaching the credit of a witness, weakening the force of his evidence, destroying his case, Second, test number two is establishing your defense. If the questions before that you prepared for a witness do not fit into the realm of these twin tests, my advice is sit down, don't cross-examine. You will do more harm. You will end up sitting on the proverbial William uh, Wendell Phillips bayonet, then firing it at someone else. Now, how does one go about impeaching the credit of a witness? The first question. Now, impeaching the credit of a witness Weakening his thoughts are conduct-based laws. Like you have to get into the conduct, past conduct of a witness, and see if you can dis discredit. Now I'll give you an example, uh, uh, something which is very regular in all murder cases and physical offenses cases. Uh, Mr. A comes to court and he says that I saw B shoot C, and he sets down. Uh, it's seemingly impossible to discredit, right? But yes. He is a man who's screaming for cross, but you need to have material for that cross. Now, how do you impeach his credit? For that, you need to see his conduct from that point where he saw B shoot C and what he did after that. Now, if he saw B shoot C, what he did after that till the point that he actually gave his statement to the police. Now, if the material before you suggests that he saw B shoot C, as he claims, and he went home and slept, Obviously, he's lying. Or he shot, he saw B shoot C, he didn't call 100. Or if he called 100, police came, did he participate in uh, taking this gentleman to the hospital? Or if he didn't, did he give any statement to the police? When was the first time he had access to police and when was the first time he actually spelled out A's name? 
that yes, in, sorry, B's name, that yes, he's the man who shot. For that, you will have to see the journey of this man from the time the offense took place to the time he actually gave his statement. And his unnatural conduct will give you an insight as to how I can discredit this man. See, there will be umpteen number of documents prepared in the interregnum. There will be an MLC prepared with the doctor. You will have to see if that man was available at the hospital, whether what he told the hospital staff, the MLC preparing doctor, uh, the constable who's on duty in the police station, when the police arrived, when was the first opportunity he had of interaction, did he say, stay silent, did he say something? If he said something, was did he specifically name B or did he not? Did he give any features? Now, all these things can give you ample material for discrediting him. So if he is a man who was known to the victim, but he chose not to do anything, and after three days, he presented himself at the police station and took the name of Mr. B, it means for sure he's lying. He, you only have to show that his conduct was unnatural. That's why this is one way of impeaching his credit. Uh, another way of impeaching the credit of a man is with the aid of his past writings, his previous writings, his previous statements. Uh, that also falls into conduct because he's some, someone who's uttered facts uh, in a written form. Either he himself wrote or an agency person wrote or he deposed in front of another judicial forum. So uh, these are things uh, which you, of course, will collect uh, during the course of your preparation of your trial. And if you find that what he's saying in court or what he said to the police runs counter to his previous other statements, you can use all this material to discredit him, impeach his credit, so that he will go home after giving his evidence uh, with a very uh, heavy heart and feeling that, yes, I don't think the judge is going to believe what I have told the judge just now. How do you weaken the case of a witness? I'll give, I'll give you a very, uh, very nice example of a, of a trial which took place in uh, 1873 in, in London, where a serving police officer called Inspector Montgomery faced trial for robbery of a bank and walking out after, after having murdered the cashier with a lot of uh, currency notes and with a lot of gold. He was represented by a lawyer called uh, Francis McDonald, a Queen's Counsel, a senior lawyer, very clever lawyer. And his defense was that uh, it's broad daylight. The bank is situated in the middle of a city. city. I couldn't have simply committed this crime and walked out. So it's all a big lie. Now to counter that defense, the Attorney General, uh, who, because it was a very high profile uh, trial of that period, he presented another police serving police officer same robes which Montgomery was wearing. He presented him in court and that witness came to court and said that, look, I am wearing the same amount of cash and gold in my clothes, in my robes, which this man was allegedly carrying that day. So it's not, this defense is bogus that nobody will get to know. Uh, but when I carry all this, like a pool cucumber, I, I walk out of a bank with currency note and gold. Now, here, how do you weaken the force of this kind of a witness? Seemingly impossible. I mean, it appeals to be so. But that's what Francis McDonough said. Okay. He questioned the witness on how he went about putting the pieces of cash and gold on his robes, whether he did it alone that morning when he was preparing for his evidence, who all assisted him, and how much time he took. So the Constable said that, yes, sir, I was assisted by three of my, uh, my uh, other policemen in the police station, my colleagues. Uh, they helped me in dodging the scash notes and my robes, gold, everything. It took about uh, an hour and a half, and then I came to testify. In a moment, the whole, whole, whole evidence of this witness was gone because Montgomery could not have spent an hour or half an hour at the bank meticulously slipping in notes and gold pieces in his robes and walking out after having killed uh, the cashier. Ultimately, Montgomery was acquitted. And uh, this, is, this is such a prime example of how uh, one should uh, cross-examine and to weaken the force of evidence and destroy of course, his, his testimony. So we learned two things. Uh, how in, with, uh, credit is impeached, it's based on conduct both uh, in terms of unnatural be human behavior or past writings, past statements, previous statements given to 
either courts or the agencies or different forums. Or if you can, by your cross-examination, um, show that his evidence cannot be believed because it's manufactured. Just like this colleague of Mont Bombay who said that, yes, I could have carried it. Nobody would have seen. But of course, it took time. It took time and effort and assistance to put that whole uh, cash and gold into his jacket. This, these are the ways. The test number two, establishing your defense. How do you uh, establish your defense from a prosecution witness? Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, this also fits in with impeaching the credit in a big way. Uh, in the example that I'm about to give, uh, in one of the trials that I was conducting a couple of years ago, uh, was defending Mr. Elyasi of having murdered his wife, uh, there was a witness who's heading the Department of Forensics of Maulana Azad Medical College, a very renowned author of a lot of medical literature. Now he, the deceased, the, the Elyasi's wife, had stab injuries on a person. Uh, the issue was whether those were self-inflicted or those were inflicted by someone else. And my client happened to be the, there alone, so the inference was he was the one who inflicted those stab injuries. Now the medical expert who came, he says that these are not self-inflicted, these are given by someone else. So the simulation was Now, fortunately in that matter, I was able to get my hands on books authored by the same witness detailing the difference between self-inflicted stab wounds or uh, stab wounds given by someone else and the difference in trajectory, the depth, the force, uh, hesitation, all these aspects are taken into consideration in that literature. And the witness himself had prepared that. Um, I put that book to him and I said that what you are saying in your report and in this case and what you're saying in your in book today runs after to your own literature. How do you explain that? And of course, so this established my defense that these were self-inflicted and at the same time impeached this man's credit because his own literature, his own authored work, his own writings came back to haunt him where he says that the indicators of self-inflicted wounds are these, the indicators of stabbing are these, and the facts of that case seem to fit simply inflicted because the trajectory of wound was such. So my line of questioning satisfied both the test number one in teaching the credit of the witness with the of his previous writings and establishing my defense that this was self-infliction right in front of my eyes. I couldn't do anything of course. The man was acquitted by the High Court so it's about a year back, based primarily by disbelieving this very renowned uh, uh, doctor, forensic expert of, uh, so still continues to serve Maulana as our medical college as the head of forensic science. Uh, so this is how you go about establishing your defense. Another way, uh, another example I can give you is uh, uh, the 2G matter, where I was uh, representing Mr. Raja and the investigating officer had come up with, to the, come to the court with a theory that my, while my client was the minister, he tweaked a policy called first come first serve, and he classified the period of offense in 2008 to 2000, 2007 to 2008 for one year while my client was the minister. He says that there was a policy uh, which was very rigid and uh, this man tweaked it all and to the disadvantage of so many people, people lost licenses, everything. My case, my defense was that there was no inflexible rigid policy, but if the IO had taken care to seize 2003 to 2007 allocation files, the truth would have come out, but he chose not to do it. If he chose not to do it, he presented a complete lie to the court because while the trial was underway and before the investigating officer who's usually the last witness to come to court, he entered the court. I had got all those files summoned to court and I had shown to the court that even before, in earlier instances, there were people who had given a very different kind of interpretation to the first come first serve. So I showed the court that half-baked truth has been presented to you. Uh, relevant files were not placed before you. And there was a departmental precedent where FCFS was interpreted in a certain way. And if the IO had chosen to be fair and gone back to investigating from 2003 to 2007, 
this case would never have seen the light of the day. I also had uh, the minutes of the CBC file where CBC, the Central Vigilance Commission, had recommended that 2G case will be investigated for four years, 2003 to 2007. But this man confined it to 2007 to 2008. So definitely he had digressed, he had disobeyed statutory or directions by a statutory agencies. He had disobeyed the general principle of fairness uh, in presenting the whole case. And on that basis, of course, he was acquitted. This is how you establish your defense. Your defense is what I'm doing has been done before. There is material, but the material is not being admitted by the investigating officer. If he does that, the court will see, the, see that, yes, I mean, there's no truth in this whole case. Uh, another way of doing it is like in a post-mortem, uh, in a murder case, a post-mortem expert came, comes and he says that uh, this is, see, this is a case of throttling. Uh, like a manual strangulation. I'm, I'm conducting a case, I can't mention the case because it would be, it's a pending case. But what happens is, in this case, uh, a post-mortem doctor comes and he says that this is a case of throttling. And when we read the post-mortem report, the indications uh, and the, the kind of injuries which surface, they seem to show that these this could not have been throttling. The, the, the chief characteristics of a throttling are missing. And you, it required a lot of uh, medical literature to be put to the doctor uh, that was put and he ultimately agreed that yes, these are the symptoms, but of course he tried to explain them away. Uh, this is the second leg, the test number two is where you try to cross-examine a witness by, for creating your own defense, establishing your own defense, which of course runs counter, but you need the prosecution witness to do it. So, but you must have facts on your side, you must have literature on your side. When you put it to the witness and you take him to a point that he can't really uh, digress from or run away from, he will ultimately end up admitting it. So test, these are the two tests. Please apply these uh, when you go to court uh, to cross-examine a witness. Whether you can impeach his credit, whether you can weaken the force of his testimony, whether you can destroy the opponent's case, and whether you can establish your own defense by your cross-examination. If you can do all these, that's the only way, that's the only scenario in which you should go and cross-examine a witness. Otherwise, I advise, don't do it. Let the witness pass, let it be downplayed by you. Because if you don't choose to cross-examine, the court will believe that this maybe there's not much in it. So that's the proper course to be adopted. Uh, some pointers, some important pointers I can give you is, uh, be, be very pleasant. Do not be hostile to the witness. Be pleasant. Uh, put the best point of your cross in the first 10 minutes. The first 10 minutes is a time when the witness is in a very agreeable state. He's come to court, he's before a judge, he's a little nervous. He wants to uh, just finish this whole thing and walk out as soon as possible because it's not an atmosphere that that witness is like. So use those 10, 15 initial minutes when he's nervous, when he's uncomfortable to your advantage by putting your best foot forward, pushing him in the back foot, but of course by being pleasant and by being cordial with him. Put short questions. And I mean, this is, and be well prepared, of course, I mean, there's no other way. So be, be nice, be cordial, be pleasant, uh, smile, uh, use the first 10 minutes very effectively and uh, Always, always apply this twin test, uh, whether you want to cross-examine it's test number one or test number two, as I detailed here. Uh, so once cross-examination is over, the next stage is uh, statement of accused in the section 313. Statement of accused, uh, I personally feel is, is of little value, but uh, courts think otherwise. They think that uh, what uh, an accused person says in this 313 can be used against him. Yes, in a limited way, so be very cautious give only answers which will not be proved to be false later. Otherwise, it has little value. Uh, you can step into a witness form under, under 315, but uh, it's rarely done. I have not done much, much of that in the last uh, 11 years or so, but I have been independently practicing. And of course, uh, next stage is defense evidence. If you think that you've not made sufficient intent in the prosecution case, go ahead and examine defense witness. Uh, then comes the final argument, of course. Final arguments, uh, don't be too long. Criminal cases and trial courts are facts dependent. Be prepared with facts 
confined to the issue do not burden the court with the case law don't courts don't like it when you cite 15 judgments if you have three good judgments to each of your issue just cite that deal with your facts first be crisp be confident be assertive believe in your case uh, i'll tell you judges have a knack of figuring out when the judge when a lawyer is saying something that he does not believe in so believe in your case first and foremost uh, that's very important uh, cross i have said the, the twin test you can apply it takes years it takes discipline it takes preparation you should observe good cross examiners when you are if you're not doing anything in your matters you're free don't waste time uh, sitting in a canteen go and watch other court rooms where crosses are underway you will learn from other people's mistake you will learn when you watch other people do a good job so be inspired work hard uh, that is how a criminal trial sees uh, sees the light of the day how it progresses and how a defense assists the court in reaching the ultimate conclusion whether for or against the prosecution now this whole uh, covid 19 covid 19 uh, has been uh, an issue which has uh, really uh, derailed the whole justice delivery system uh well my my point here is this criminal trial is like contact sport you know it's it requires physical presence physical presence is not is required by the statute uh, witnesses should be present in court accused should be present lawyers should be present and the whole process of recording evidence is such that you need to be in the vicinity close to the witness to observe him to observe the other lawyer the body language of the witness so all these things are not achievable by video conferencing so i think looking at the near future and how we are placed today in dealing with this disease the court should uh, only categorize custody matters as urgent and get those to be conducted in open as far as bails uh, charges arguments uh, revisions uh, summary applications for 311 or other short pauses i think those can be uh, classified into a category where a video conferencing here here it will suffice so that's something uh, i think the supreme court has also done uh, 4th of may 2020 at action came that evidence if at all to be recorded has to be recorded with the consent but the delhi high court did not say anything so this is how it it, it looks right now uh, it's not a happy situation but at the same time we cannot allow uh, people who are in custody to be sitting there indefinitely so courts need to be a little more liberal with bails uh, if anyone is in, is even remotely entitled he should be given bail and people who really don't deserve to be out their their cases can get underway but there is no no real substitute for conducting it in open court so open court hearing is a must for uh, or at least for recording of evidence that's the only way that it can be done there's no other way so this is uh, all that i want to say uh, i think my time is also over uh, i'm open to any questions that uh, any one of you may want to ask thank you mr sharma for such an informative and uh, insightful session we are sure this will help many lawyers and students in conducting trials in the coming years so uh, let us take the questions that we have received so the first question is during the trial why is it not uh, mandatory on the part of the police to supply all the documents to the accused person doesn't this infringes the fundamental right of the accused person so the law is with us uh, they have to do it they don't do it out of uh, a very misplaced sense of justice but uh, if you read section 169 if you read the law on this subject there is no way they have to apply and that's why you need to you as a defense lawyer need to be proactive and going and showing that law to the court and say that no we i have a right to this there is no other way so they are not entitled there is no power with them uh, they they may go and claim it but that's your job to dislodge that okay uh the second question is uh, right to speedy trial what does that even mean <laughs> <laughs> well i am also still figuring that out uh it's a constant struggle uh i think i mean there's been a lot of talk about how, how few judges we have and uh, we need more judges of course that's the case uh but 
again, our system is such that it ensures that most cases become trials. And uh, this is one such example where important evidence is withheld. So if that's done, of course, the whole process suffers. Uh, more cases are, the workload increases, more cases turn into trials. So that's, I mean, the point that I made of fair investigation and fair supply of documents helps that cause first and foremost. Uh, it's impossible to ensure speedy trial with the current strength of judges. So I think it's important that bail law is liberally construed and interpreted and applied by judges. So people who don't get speedy trial at least are out on bail and they can go on about their life. Uh, it's, it's, it's an institutional change which will take time. Uh, so many things uh, at play. I mean, financial aspects of the government, uh, the infrastructure. So, I mean, it's, it's really difficult for us to really today say how and how it's a dream and how it can be rectified. So it will take time, but yeah, people can be out on bail and face trials. Yes. All right. So next question we have is, uh, in a money laundering case, if there are, there are like too much of layering, how to find the trail of the money or the proceed of the crime? <laughs> it's not your job. It's the job of the enforcement directorate, directorate to, uh, to find the trail. Uh, it's their job to establish layering. As, as someone who uh, appears for defense in this money laundering aspects, you need to break only one chain. That the scheduled offense which is alleged, that was not the source of the money which is today being projected as proceed of crime. Uh, there is no uh, projection as untainted something which was in the first place untainted in a way. So you uh, can't, can't do much about it. You, there is no layering that you can go and discover. Let them do their job and then you do your job to create a doubt about their case. Okay, that was an interesting answer. Uh, Mr. Sharma, there's one question. Uh, what is the scope for first generation lawyers in litigation? <laughs> tremendous, tremendous. Uh, I think uh, don't go by all this uh, first generation or second generation. It is true that uh, if uh, that someone enters the profession with, uh, with a father or an uncle who's been either a lawyer or a judge, he gets a start, yes, uh, undoubtedly. Uh, he comes from a system where his, his family is known. So getting and procuring work is a little easier, of course. There's no undoubtedly. But I'll tell you one thing, and I can speak from my experience. If you're willing to put in the long hours, if you put your heart and soul and blood into it, no force on earth can stop you. So go by your instincts, work hard, read. You will get the chances. God will create those chances make the most of your chances and believe me, you will end up doing better in the generations. All right. Next question is, uh, one person wants to know how to face trial in the CGM or GM courts and how to deal with uh, section 438 and 439 CRPC. So these are two separate questions. Magistrate trials are of two categories, summons and warrants. The procedure is well laid in the code of criminal procedure. Uh, that will tell you um, uh, the procedure, how one should go. I mean, the overall approach continues to be the same, which I today uh, discussed with you guys. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether it's sessions or magistrate. The procedure, by and large, uh, continues to be the same. Magistrates a little, have a little more leeway uh, in the sense that they are 239 and 240, where they can discharge even before final arguments if the evidence is found, uh, found insufficient to continue the trial. So it's a little more... Uh, flexible and more favorable to be accused. Summons, of course, there's only a notice required. Uh, 438 and 439 are anticipatory bail and uh, regular bail. I, anticipatory bail has been expounded upon on so many occasions by the Read that law. Uh, uh, 439 again is expounded upon by many times in, by the Supreme Court in various high courts. Uh, bail, uh, bail one must get unless he's a threat to society, unless he's, uh, there are chances that he will flee and unless he's, go, he's something, someone who will go and tamper with the witnesses. So uh, I think you should leave your bail argument on these three principal grounds that my client will not do any of these three things. And the seriousness of offense, uh, I mean, does weigh, of course, in murder matters, it's, it's a little more difficult. Uh, but yes, in other offenses, I think these three parameters work to your advantage provided Client is a well-behaved gentleman. All 
it, right? Uh, next question we have is, um, how young lawyers need to adapt to this changing times in litigation and how to start uh, litigating after completing law? Well, uh, I think the first thing that you need to do, uh, and it's a matter of uh, more than choice at times, be a part of a good chamber. Uh, a good chamber uh, I mean, is very important. It shapes your approach. Uh, it shapes your personality. Uh, it shapes the way you start conducting yourself in court. So first and foremost, uh, join a good chamber. You should be lucky. Uh, be wise when you take that call. And of course, you have to be lucky that that gentleman will take you in his chamber. Uh, first few years, don't think about money. Uh, you have to sustain yourself. But of course, money comes later when you work hard and when, you, when you're consistent. So it will come, of course. Uh, there's no substitute for hard work. Once you are in a chamber, become indispensable for your senior. Your senior should call you the moment anything comes to him. That all right, this person will help me and assist me in this matter. Once you reach that stage in any chamber, half the job is done. And then of course, as time passes, you will start getting your own matters and then it's, your, it's up to you to shine. Okay. So there is this one very interesting question. Uh, how feasible do you think is this virtual setup on video conferencing during cross-examination? How do we ascertain that the witness is alone? Not, not at all. Uh, video conferencing can, can be lethal, can be damaging for cross because uh, a person who is not in front of you, he may be getting tutored, he may be, he may be someone is leading him, he may be having a statement right in front of his eyes. Uh, that's something that you can't do anything about. Uh, you will always be in the dark. Uh, the judges cannot uh, comment on their demeanor. They can, they can, I mean, so many things can go wrong. So that's why I said that courts need to today proactively adjourn uh, bail matters. People who are in custody, their trials should be adjourned for some time and only those should be conducted in open court. I am I'm completely against video conference evidence. Completely, completely. There, there is no way that that can be. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the next question. So we have advocate Arun Gupta who wants to know if one of the accused is released under section 169 CRPC and we have proper evidence to prove his involvement, then what are the options to take him before the court of law and the role of IO in this situation? Well, uh, the courts are empowered to further investigate, direct further investigation. The courts are also empowered to summon if the evidence is already there in the, so uh, you can file a protest petition, you can uh, apply for monitoring of the investigation before the court, you can point out the evidence which has been left out. So under 156.3, now the scope with the magistrate is way, way broader than it was say five years back. So today you can, you can really get the court to monitor investigation in any direction that you want. I mean, of course it should hold good, it should be meritorious, not something uh, agenda driven. So if some important aspect has been left out, go out, go file a monitoring application and the court will be is bound to look into it and get the IU's response to it. Okay, so there's this one more question which says, can we get a copy of FIR from the IU as a matter of right or do we have to go through the lengthy process of applying for the certified copy? Well, uh, see under 157, FIR has to be forthright sent to the magistrate once it is registered. So in law, you, are, you have a right and they are under an obligation to put it now on the website. Uh, if they don't give you, you go and sit and apply to the magistrate. All right, Mr. Sharma, there's a question which says, do you think that courts and legal fraternity will absorb and continue to use some of the interim measures to deal with the COVID situation, such as online hearings? <laughs> I wish I knew the answer, uh, but right now the situation uh, is not very good. Uh, I hear the number of cases uh, it's increasing. So I think in the in the near future it's going to be difficult. So they need to evolve a mechanism to counter this. All right. Uh, the other question is uh, in these uh, recent developments where the home buyers are being duped off. Uh, by the builders, often agencies like ED get involved and the properties get attached. How to safeguard the interest of the home buyers who seek loans and pay the builders? 
well uh, it's something which is bothering uh, all the ed forums uh, even nclt so this is i mean once you attach something then the the stakeholders are in an absolute mess uh, it's it's an evolving situation so there is nothing settled on that point yet okay this one now uh, so, uh, question which is uh, what if the pregnant women's fetus was aborted without her consent the fetus was only 13 weeks old can we make that doctor in accused in the fir well they do go through a, a mechanism which is uh, there in that medical termination of pregnancy act uh, the doctor if prima facie there is some uh, something to hold him liable yes he can be named then uh, he will it's his job to establish that act, whatever was within his uh, duty he had done okay one more question which is i think a very uh, general question that why the legal system of india is not able to conduct trials promptly promptly uh, well uh, same uh, we don't have enough number of judges uh, that's the only reason uh, they once they start having more courts i think it will become more streamlined and faster yes but that's it's not there in the near future that's my reading of the situation so prompt trials I mean, unfortunately, even in uh, offences like the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which provide for day-to-day -day trial, those people are given dates of three months, four months. So forget about other matters which don't provide for day-to-day -day trials. Situation is bad in those terms. We do. I mean, even if you get directions, they are hardly implementable directions. So it's a difficult situation. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's for the government uh, to step in and improve the infrastructure in terms of the number of judges. Okay. uh next question we have uh, you know fir register directly through the police officials when it is known that they are deliberately not doing the investigation and delaying the case under which provision of law one can approach the trial court 156 3 uh, so it's now very broadened as i answered in the previous question if the complainant feels agreed even if the accused feels agreed uh, both can approach the court and uh, but the accused can only do it after a charge sheet has been filed that's how the law has gone Developed. Complainant can even do it before a charge sheet is filed. So both can approach a magistrate under one fifty six three, point out the areas which are not being investigated, or if there is a deliberate delay, all these things they can then work on. And the court will issue necessary directions. All right, Mr. Sharma. There's one more question. So what do you think about the high-powered committee constituted under the Honorable Supreme Court? Recently stated that under trial prisoner for even murder cases. Would be considered for bail who have spent two years. What do I think of it? Uh, well, it's a it's a step in the right direction because uh, trials are getting delayed, uh, and I'm sure that uh, whoever has been conferred with that discretion will apply his or her mind properly and ensure that only people who really deserve uh, roll out of court uh, of jails and come out. So. All right. So it looks like we have answered all the questions. Is there anything else that you would like to add, Mr. Sharma, before we wrap up? Well, I wish everyone the best. Uh, this is something which should not last very long. Hopefully, things will uh, get better soon. But in the meanwhile, uh, use this vacation constructively. Read a lot. Uh, read all kinds of literature, uh, and uh, enjoy it. And wait for the courts to reopen. And good luck and God bless. great thank you so much uh, mr sharma and thank you uh, everyone for participating in today's legit class we hope to see you again next time and you subscribe to our legit quest youtube channel and you can see this video recording there once it is uploaded thank you so much have a good day thank you thank you thank you sir thank you varun thank you so much thank you everyone thank you thank you sir